Cool. Okay. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so what I want to talk to you all about today is are real-world assets the answer to the DeFi kind of boom-bust cycle? And uh, you know, what, what do I mean by that? Um, typically, what you see in DeFi is that uh, revenue is generated you know, from typically yield. Um, and that is highly like, correlated with you know, the volume that's being traded or the volume that's being borrowed, right? And so when we see kind of this ebb and flow of like, activity uh, in DeFi you know, uh, from the bull market to the bear market, you know, we see this like, very, very volatile um, kind of graph of like, revenue generation, right? And uh, this is a, you know, a problem that I think uh, young companies face like in, in, in many industries. Um, but part of like the maturation process is to start smoothing out that revenue. So you have like continuity of, of operations, right? Because the last thing you want to do is hire like uh, 50 people, 100 people in the bull market just to then have to like uh, let everybody go at the end and have like this huge brain drain, right? Um, so uh, how, do, how do we get there? Um, I kind of think real world assets are like uh, a significant like piece to the puzzle here, and uh, so I would like to take some time you know to to tell you why I think that is and, and how you can kind of go about doing that uh, that yourselves so um, quick chill uh, about us uh, we 're chronicle um, we are an oracle protocol that spun out of MakerDAO. Uh, fun fact, um, at Maker, we actually created the first Oracle on Ethereum in, uh, went live on Mainnet in May of 2017. Um, and the reason we built this Oracle was because at the time, there was no existing Oracle solution. Uh, so when we were trying to build DAI, um, you know, we had to like, before we could even start building DAI, we had to build out all of these other primitives first. So, you know, Maker created the first oracles on Ethereum. We created the first DEX on Ethereum. We created the first like Solidity debugger. We actually just spent like the first 18 months not even actually working, like writing a single line of DAI code um, and just like building up like the, uh, the infrastructure that we needed. Um, and so oracles were, were a big piece of that. Um, so I, I want to talk about uh, Maker a little bit. And so uh, to kind of get you guys up to speed, right, uh, what does MakerDAO do? Uh, Maker is a stablecoin protocol, uh, right? We have a uh, stablecoin called DAI. Um, it's uh, backed, it was originally backed by just Ethereum. Uh, then a few years later, right, we added the ability to use multiple collateral types, right? So you could start using uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, Lido staked ETH or wrapped Bitcoin, right, or even uh, link tokens, right, what, whatever it is. Um, but about two years ago, Maker took um, a pretty significant step and started using kind of off-chain um, collateral, right? So uh, assets that were not kind of crypto native. And so uh, here uh, you can kind of see all this data on makerburn.com. But what essentially this is, is it's showing like all of the revenue that MakerDAO makes from uh, crypto collateral, right? And so you can see up here, right, there's like different types of vaults that have, um, you know, different uh, loan to value ratios and different interest rates. And you can see on this column on the, uh, on the far right, you know, uh, how many uh, millions of dollars makers is, is uh, kind of making from that. Um, so, Right, uh, this screenshot's a little bit old. I think it's now up to like 200 million um, there, thereabouts. And now let's take a look at the real world asset uh, revenue, right? And so what do I mean when I say a real world asset? Because I feel like this is kind of like a meme that's like thrown out and like, uh, you know, what, what is the tangible like actual asset that we're talking about here? Um, Due to the um, increase you know, of rates uh, by central banks, um, treasury bills became extremely lucrative over the past couple of years, right? With uh, most central banks having around you know, between four, five, and 6% rates. Um, and from an investment point of view, right, this is a essentially risk-free return, 
right? And maybe not as much as a potential equity return, right? But it's like, uh, it's good enough uh, for the safety that it provides. And so this was like the catalyst for RWAs taking off and really like finding product market fit. Uh, because when uh, markets are bullish, right, um, people want to lever up, right? Um, and uh, that generates, right, a ton of like borrowing activity. But when markets are bearish, nobody wants leverage when number goes down. Um, there's barely any like borrowing activity. Uh, the consistency of treasury bill revenue here is, is very, very significant, right? So you can see here um, at the top, right, we have Monetalis Clydesdale, Block Tower Andromeda, and Coinbase Custody. Those are all essentially uh, vehicles for holding short-dated uh, U.S. treasury bills. Um, with kind of like rolling uh, maturities like every month. Um, there's even another one on here, HV Bank. Um, HV Bank is a uh, smaller bank in uh, the east coast of the U.S. Uh, that writes mortgage loans. And essentially, Maker is underwriting uh, those mortgage loans. And, you know, we have a deal with the bank where the bank has to hold on to at least, you know, 50% of the exposure to that mortgage, right, uh, to, uh, so they don't have more moral hazard of just, like, writing uh, bad loans, right? Um, and th there's a couple of ones on here, but I, I, I don't want to go into this too much, but uh, there's essentially a plethora of opportunities here all the way up and down the risk curve, right? From the safest thing like treasury bills all the way up to, you know, municipal bonds, corporate credit, uh, structured products, um, whatever it is, right? And, you know, higher risk, higher yield, lower risk, lower yield. So... Um, Taking, this is a graph of kind of like the uh, distribution of the sources of revenue uh, that MakerDAO has had uh, since, uh, since its launch, right? And so in the blue here, this is revenue from uh, crypto-backed uh, loans, right? And so you can see up until around like, uh, you know, halfway through 2022, right, 100% of Maker's revenue came from these crypto-backed loans. And then you see in the, in the white, uh, sorry, in the uh, yellow, I'm a little bit colorblind, uh, you see in the yellow uh, uh, category mark public credit, right? And th this is essentially the, uh, the uh, predominantly the treasury bill revenue that Maker is seeing, right? And so Maker has managed to, in, you know, uh, around 18 months, uh, really diversify its revenue stream that it's not so dependent on this, like, boom-bust nature of, of uh, like cyclical nature that we have in, in DeFi. And so, you know, for those of you working in DeFi like here or like, you know, uh, innovating new things, I would encourage you to like explore these like opportunities because even though like uh, it may sound more comfortable and easier, you know, to st stick to crypto native, uh, you're really leaving a lot of opportunity on the table by not like exploring these other options. But you know, with anything, um, it's not a free lunch, right? Uh, RWAs like add an enormous amount of complexity, um, and so I, I think the way to sum it up is RWAs are not crypto native, right? Um, when you have a token on chain, right, uh, you can immediately get, you know, the supply, you know who the holder is, right, you know exactly how much they have, right, you can even uh, query the price in a decentralized way on chain. RWAs don't have this because what, typically what you have on chain is not the RWA itself, it's a representation of the RWA. And so this leads to a lot of problems when you're integrating an RWA that you don't really have with crypto native collateral. Because essentially the way to think about the RWA token is it's a dummy token. It's just like an entry on your ledger. And so you require a lot of context um, and a lot of data, uh, like metadata that corresponds to this uh, RWA that you don't really need in that crypto native context. And so um, while the metadata for an RWA is going to be very unique to the type of that real-world asset, 
Um, I want to quickly touch on a non-exhaustive list of like some of the factors and categories of data that, that you may want to consider, right? And so, for example, let's, uh, let's start with custody. So um, when you have a real-world asset, right, it will be custodied in, you know, um, in some kind of institution, right? And there are, are, are kind of various risk factors here, uh, but typically you want some kind of um, bank or some kind of trust. Uh, that is the custodian of the asset, right? And it's important, right, uh, that you have some mechanism to uh, determine and assert in real time, you know, how much of those assets are actually sitting there in custody. Because remember, what you have on chain is just a dummy token, right? And so uh, that dummy token could be completely worthless if there's not sufficient amount of assets in custody, right? Or it could be one-to-one, -one, right? But uh, you need to have real-time data kind of asserting uh, what's actually there in, in the real world, you know? So we have a mirror image representation of that on the crypto side. Uh, let's talk about liquidity, right? Um, I think in crypto we get really wrapped up in, oh, this is the price of the asset. Um, and I think um, a gentleman from Chain Security yesterday was talking about Oracle as DeFi. I think uh, uh, summed it up really well that uh, we shouldn't think about price as like a static number. We should think about price in the context of uh, how many tokens Y can I get if I sell X amount of tokens on the market? And so it is a price with the context of liquidity because you can have a very high price with very low liquidity. And if you were to sell 100,000, 500,000, a million dollars into that market, uh, you will have a drastically different price impact depending on the liquidity. And so with real world assets, um, some of them are extremely liquid, right? You know, I mentioned treasury bills earlier. Treasury bills are one of the most liquid markets in the world. But others are extremely illiquid, right? Uh, they may not even be publicly traded. They may only trade in like dark pools. Uh, some of them are never traded, right? They're just held until maturity, right? And so um, it's not as simple as just oh, here is the price of this RWA, let's bring that on chain, and now people can borrow against that RWA. Uh, the liquidity and the discounted pricing uh, as a factor or function of liquidity is extremely important. Um, counterparty risk, right? Um, let, let's kind of talk about like how RWAs are structured, and while they're, it's a very young market at the moment and where there's very little standardization of how you legally actually structure one of these. Um, I want to delve into one example using Maker um, to kind of give you a sense of like what are the different like actors involved here and how do they all interact. So in a Maker kind of structure, what you typically have is you have a trust and the beneficiary of that trust is the maker protocol itself. And essentially this trust in its bylaws uh, essentially can only uh, execute instructions that are given to it by maker governance. So maker governance has to do a vote and the trust can only do anything if maker gives it instructions. Um, next to the trust, you will have some kind of broker, right? Because someone has to go and purchase and sell these securities. Right uh, next to the broker, right, you'll have a custodian, right, because the the broker then needs to um, put those assets in custody on behalf of the trust. The trust, you know, can own the assets, but it can't custody them themselves. Um, and then even next to the custodian, you may want to have an auditor, right? Um, and so uh, you know, an auditor checking that you know the assets uh, that the custodian has in custody are actually custody there, and are actually you know what they claim to have in custody. And so, when you're thinking of like this data, you have to think about well, how am I going to get that data? Um, and 
I, I think it's a trap to say like, oh, well, like, I'll just go to the custodian and I'll just check what's in custody. Or, oh, I'll just go to the broker and ask them like, what did you buy and sell? Or, oh, I'll just go to the trust and be like, hey, trustee, what instructions did you give to like, you know, uh, to, for people to do, right? Or, or even the auditor. And the problem here is that each of these actors have moral hazard, right? Um, they have moral hazard in the sense that if Maker stops providing credit, uh, then they stop making money. So there is a um, incentive for them, right, to uh, fib or, or stretch the truth or, or lie, if you will, right? And so the only way that you can really start to build up confidence on chain in a snapshot of what the state of the real world is, is by starting to have composability of all of these different counterparties, right? And so what do I mean by that? Well, it would mean you don't just trust the custodian. You don't just trust the trustee. You don't just trust the broker. You don't just trust the auditor. You only trust them in when they all have symmetry. And so what I mean by symmetry is, well, maker governance, right, sends money to the trust, right, and gives them instructions, hey, buy 50 million of short-dated, you know, U.S. treasuries, right? The trust will acknowledge that they received those instructions, that they sent the money to the broker, and that they relayed those instructions to the broker, and then they will attest. They will sign with their key, right? You know, this is, this is what's going in, this is what's going out. You do the same thing with the broker. The broker says, I received these instructions and this amount of money from the trust, this is what we did. We bought XYZ, we bought you know, XYZ2, we bought XYZ3, we have this amount, this is the nav, this is the yield, this is the duration, right? And then we send it to the custodian, right? And so you do this for every actor, in, out, in, out, in, out. And so only when you have complete symmetry of all this information can you say with high confidence, oh, okay, you know, it's highly likely that they're not all colluding together. Um, and so you can say with a fairly high degree of confidence, yes, like, you know, the protocol is, uh, uh, can lend against this at this rate um, because, you know, this is what's happening in, in the real world. And so the last thing I want to talk about is, is yield, right? Um, a lot of these real world assets are yield bearing, right? That's why a DeFi protocol would want to extend credit to a real world asset, right? It wants to make money. So if MakerDAO loans half a billion dollars, you know, uh, to some entity to buy T-bills, well, it's because MakerDAO wants to make T-bill yield. But from the protocol perspective, it, the protocol has no idea how much yield it's generating. Right, on, on particular real world asset number one, on particular real world asset number two, on particular real world asset number three. So the protocol is kind of like blind, right? And this kind of goes into the discrepancy between crypto native and non crypto native, right? Uh, where, you know, in a crypto native sense, the protocol has complete omnipotence uh, over, okay, what is the yield? What is the price? What is the liquidity, right? And in an RWA context, it doesn't have that. And so, uh, you know, yield is an incredibly important part, right? And so let me, like, describe to you a context in which, you know, um, an oracle could, you know, delivering all this data, what kind of utility it provides to your protocol. Um, so let's assume that Maker has, you know, 200 million in RWA number one, 300 million in RWA number two, and 400 million in RWA number three. Uh, the protocol wants to optimize the yield it's generating. Well, using oracles, it now has the insight into knowing that, oh, well, it's generating 3% on number one, you know, 4% on number two, and only 1% on number three. And so the protocol can now, in an automated fashion, right, reallocate credit from the, you know, RWA number three that it has $400 million in, um, automatically send those sign those instructions and send them to the trust to execute the appropriate sales, receive the money, and then reallocate that uh, to you know, the other RWA bucket that's higher yielding, right? So the protocol can now effectively automate its management of credit and optimize yield, right? Uh, you can talk about you know, um, jurisdictional exposure management, right? 
Maybe the protocol doesn't want to have all of its eggs in one basket, right? And it wants a diversity of exposure between uh, the US and Singapore and London and Hong Kong, right? Uh, Dubai, right? Um, and it can notice, oh, well, right now, you know, we have 35% exposed to the US. We want to get that down to around 22%, right? And do this automated rebalancing, right, in, in this manner, right? Um, there could be other factors, right? So in MakerDAO, the die peg is stabilized, uh, or hard, the hard peg is reinforced by a swap facility called the peg stability module, or PSM for short. And all it essentially is, is a smart contract that has a bunch of USDC uh, or other stable coins in it uh, that uh, that smart contract will let you redeem DAI one for one. So if you give it a DAI, it could give you a USDC.